Um, so I'm going to talk about neoadjuvant or meaning preoperative and adjuvant or postoperative therapy um, surrounding the time of surgery. So as you heard from Dr. Blakely, you know, surgical resection may be curative. And the goals of resection of tumors, um, as you just heard, are, are taking the entire tumor out without rupturing it, um, getting negative margins or R0, as he described, you know, and sort of generally avoiding lymphadenectomy outside of select cases with the SDH deficient GIS, or perhaps the gene fusion GISTs also tend to have higher rates of lymph node metastases. But unfortunately, you know, as much as we'd like to say we can take everything out, complete resection is not always possible. These are just two cases of very advanced GIS um, that we took care of. And so there's really a couple of factors that we consider when we're in terms of trying to make the treatment decisions um, about GIS, and it's really the biology of the tumors and then the location and anatomy. You know, it's pretty easy if somebody's got good location, meaning that, as Dr. Blakely said, it's on the on the greater curve or the edge of the stomach and it's small that could be easily done laparoscopically you know the opposite being um or those cases that have bad location and good biology or good location and bad biology those are a little bit more tricky sometimes those we got to think about a little bit more and sort of plan out the operation and then certainly those with bad location and bad biology we need to take a you know stop for a second and sort of really plot out um a course that's specific, um, you know, for that patient. Um, and so that's where potentially the role for neoadjuvant therapy comes in. So again, just for some definition. So neoadjuvant means before a planned operation, whether it be open or laparoscopic adjuvant, meaning afterwards. So the, the guidelines currently for neoadjuvant therapy are, are the following, and this is according to the, the NCCN or the National Conference of Cancer Network, um, and then the ESMO, which is the European Society of Medical Oncology Recommendations. So marginally resectable disease, so like locally advanced or very large tumors where total gross resection may not be feasible, likely positive margins, um, as he just described, potential for adjacent organ sparing um, in the situations where um, the tumors do start invading into adjacent organs, opportunities for less extensive operations or potentially safer operations, so less bleeding or less likely to rupture the tumor. And so I'm not going to go into all the details, but suffice it to say, there's been studies looking at whether it's safe to give matinib before surgery um, um, or not. And the answer is it is safe. And so what are those sort of bad locations? Um, he, Dr. Blakely mentioned one of them being at the gastroesophageal junction or right at the top where the esophagus becomes the stomach, um, as you can see on the right there. You know, that's a scenario where, you know, if it's a large tumor, we might have to do a total gastrectomy, meaning taking out the entire stomach. And that's a pretty morbid operation um, in terms of the big operation. And it certainly has a major effect on, on your ability to eat. Um, a second one is in the duodenum. So the first portion of the small intestine right here, where the stomach sort of transitions to the small intestine, this is where the pancreas sits and the bile duct runs right through there. And so if there's a large tumor in this region, what it might require is taking out that entire region, which means doing three connections, one to the pancreas, one to the bile duct, and then one to the stomach. This is called a Whipple or a pancreatic duodenectomy. Again, a very big operation, high morbidity, um, you know, even, uh, you know, reasonable, albeit not very high, but there is mortality risk for that type of operation as well. And then in the rectum, so right at the bottom there, um, you know, sometimes if it's a very large tumor, what does that require? Well, we call a low anterior resection, which means taking out the whole rectum and then reconnecting it again and giving somebody a temporary ostomy bag. Um, or an abdominal perineal resection, meaning taking out the entire rectum, not reconnecting them and giving them a permanent colostomy bag. And so sometimes if we can get those to shrink down, we can avoid having to do a total gastrectomy where we could just wedge out that area of the stomach. We could just wedge out that part of the duodenum, or we could just wedge out that part of the rectum in order to um, prevent that from um, being a bigger operation. So what about bad location, bad biology? That's a, clearly another you know, case. This is a case that we published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology several years ago. The patient, you can see here, this is all tumor here. Um, 
This is encasing the main blood vessel that supplies the uh, liver. And you can see a really bulky disease before imatinib. We gave imatinib and you can see this thing almost completely shrink away to the point that we were able to completely resect the tumor. And so something that uh, Dr. Crago and I were always taught as fellows together um, was that biology beats technique. But what we know is that if the tumor responds, patients do better. And this is based upon um, you can see these, these, these survival curves here, both the recurrence rates or progression free survival and then overall survival. So what about, so what are the summary here? So neoadjuvant therapy is generally safe for patients. It's usually recommended. We generally will treat people for often six to nine months to achieve maximal response. We can think about stopping it earlier if it's not going to change the conduct of the operation anymore. Um, a matinib may be stopped immediately before an operation and can start it, be started once somebody's recovered. Um, and we should start thinking about tailoring this for the resistance mutations that you heard earlier. So um, thinking about things like avapritinib, albeit we don't have any data right now for the PDGFR alpha and D842V um, safety with avapritinib. So what about, so then the last part I'm going to talk about is adjuvant therapy. So what, so how do we decide who should get adjuvant therapy? So as I told you before, resection is the primary um, treatment for GIST. However, it's not routinely curative for all patients with GIST. And so patients can certainly develop recurrences. And so how do we calculate the risk of recurrence? Well, there's been a ton of different studies looking at risk of recurrence. But what you can see is there's really three things that are essentially across the board are important. Mitotic rate, which Dr. Blakely just showed you, that figure, that mitotic figure, tumor size, the tumor site, um, and then whether they have tumor rupture it seems to be our common themes. And so the, the most common scoring schema I like to use is the modified NIH criteria um, that, was, uh, that was reported by Joe Ensu um, as a modification um, of the NIH criteria. And this basically classifies as tumors um, based upon these four factors into very low, low, intermediate, and high risk. And so um, the one caveat I'll point out is just, is just as a point of clarification, because it can be confusing in reports, it can be refusing in the literature, is that the mitotic count here says per 50 high power fields. The per 50 is using the old microscopes that used to be um, used. Now it's either 20 high power fields or most pathologists are now porting it out per five millimeter squared. They're all the same, but it just really depends upon the scope and how broad or narrow that old, the scopes are in terms of what they look at. But as you can see here, you know, I told you size and mitotic index are important, but no matter what the size and mitotic index are, if the tumor ruptures, you know, it could be a two centimeter tumor with a mitotic count of one, but if you rupture it, that puts you automatically to high risk disease. So it's really important that, that the surgeons are careful in terms of handling the tumors. So Going back to, so adjuvant therapy. So there's been many trials and I'm going to sort of skip ahead because of time, but there's been really been two pivotal trials. One was a trial of placebo versus one year of imatinib in patients with just greater than three centimeters. And what this trial um, showed was that it, that in patients that received one year of um, imatinib therapy, that that decreased the risk of, of, of um, recurrence or, the, or it improved the recurrence-free survival. It did not translate into a difference in overall survival. Now, the sort of the subsequent trial that really kind of set the stage for, you know, those patients that would perhaps benefit not only in terms of recurrence, but also in terms of survival was the um, SSG18 um, study out of uh, Germany and Scandinavia. And I sort of, what I call is the rule of tens was what they chose rather than the three centimeters and greater, they chose more high risk tumors. So they chose what we would consider now the, 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 in that high risk group. So tumors over 10, mitotic count over 10 or five and five, five centimeters, five mitoses or tumor rupture. And what you can see in that study is that this was not only led to a difference in decreasing the risk of um, recurrence, but it also led to an improvement in overall survival. And so kind of what can we summarize? Well, if you've, if you've got high-risk disease, you should definitely be you know, offered a matinib if your sequencing suggests that you've got a mutation that would be sensitive to it. Intermediate risk, there's clearly data for it from, that, um, from the 
the placebo versus one year trial, um, you know, or in cases where there's a positive margin or some other extenuating circumstance where it may be um, reasonable to think about it. But certainly we wouldn't recommend it in general for people with low risk or very low risk um, disease. But, you know, then the question is how long? Well, if you notice here, um, you know, a, if in the patients, this is the one year versus three year trial of um, imatinib. If the patient stopped imatinib here or stopped imatinib here, this would be the one year and the three year time points. About a year or so later, you can see the curves dramatically drop off, you know, in both cases, suggesting that imatinib, you know, in these cases of high risk disease may not be sort of curing the disease, but may just be sort of um, putting the cells in a quiescent state or sort of just holding things at bay. You know, raising the question of how long should we really be treating these patients? Um, many people are sort of moving on from the three years to even talking about potentially even indefinite therapy or until patients develop recurrences or intolerance. Um, it's still an area of debate and it's still an area of study. Um, and there's ongoing trials right now. There's been a study of five years and now there's, there's additional studies going on looking at, you know, the, the length of treatment. So in summary, um, adjuvant therapy, um, should be performed or decided based upon assessing the patient's individual risk of recurrence. Um, and because just may occurred, reoccurred despite glo uh, complete resection, um, the risk assessment is complex and really depends upon the four factors to determine, um, that I mentioned before. Um, if therapy is recommended, you know, certainly we, patients should receive um, mutation testing to confirm they've got a kit mutation versus a PDGFR alpha versus an STH, et cetera, because we only want to treat those patients with an imatinib sensitive mutation. And finally, adjuvant therapy for at least three years um, is now the gold standard for high risk tumors um, with considerations of even longer and that really remains to be determined. And finally, we, in select cases, we can consider treating patients with intermediate risk disease.